back to the first slide.
Wait, okay, um, so let's get started. Um, now, um, so what you'll notice is that this session, like the other sessions, is a, is a two-hour session. But we have two topics in this session, both emotions and self-consciousness. So we're going to have to kind of double time our way through this session. So let's get going then. So our first speaker is uh, Diana Rice uh, from Hunter College, who is also uh, works uh, at the Cooney Graduate Center as part of the group on uh, animal behavior and comparative psychology. She works primarily on cognition and communication in dolphins and other cetaceans and also in African elephants, and is probably best known to many people here for her work in mirror recognition experiments. So take it away, Diana. Good afternoon. This is always a tough spot. Everybody just ate. Don't try to stay up <laughs> for this. They just try to stay conscious after eating. Anyway, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, it's, I've, I've learned so much in just the past day and also this morning. So I'm going to talk. We're talking about behavior now. We've talked a lot about what may be going on in terms of the neuro neurophysiology of the animals and the neuroanatomy. I want to talk about behavior because that's what I really study. I haven't gotten into any kind of brain studies yet. So. Um, one of the things that I think we can all say now, I'm listening to all the things we've heard over the past you know, day and this morning, is that consciousness in other minds may manifest in very different or in, in similar ways to our own. And I couldn't resist putting up this slide. I don't know how many of you have seen Arrival. I really love this film. I've worked with the SETI community for a long time looking for signs of what would we do if we ever found extraterrestrial life. And in many ways, I think, uh, looking for signs of, con of consciousness or intelligent-like behavior, goal-directed behavior in, uh, in other species, non-human animals, because we're part of the animal world, uh, is much like this. Uh, this is non-terrestrial. These are non-terrestrials. And deciphering their behavior and their communication is really not an easy problem. And you really have to bring a lot of tools with you to do so. Um, a lot of my background was in symbolic behavior, bioacoustics, language development. And, uh, but you know, you need to work with other people who have very different perspectives, such as many of you in the, in the audience who have a background in philosophy, in biology, in neuroscience. So um, what I wanted to propose is that what much of what I think I've been doing is looking at for varieties of conscious experience uh, in studies of animal nature, searching for signatures of consciousness, so to speak. And I've tr what I've tried to do in my work is create opportunities to get what I call glimpses into the nature of consciousness, into the nature of animal minds in their intelligence. Some of my work involves um, decoding dolphin communication. We're continuing those studies right now as well. And again, when I say glimpses, it's really hard to discern intelligent behavior in animals. Maybe it looks really complex, but it's not. Uh, maybe it looks simple, but it's more complex. So let's take a little journey thinking about some of those things today. So I want to introduce you to the guys I work with. These are bottlenose dolphins, Terceops truncatus. Um, bottlenose dolphins are um, really about as alien as you can get on this planet, in my opinion. I work with them. They're true non-terrestrials, not extraterrestrials, because they've evolved uh, in a totally marine uh, existence. And I consider them my research collaborators because I try to work with them in ways that I give them opportunities to show us how they'll interact with systems. I haven't been interested in training dolphins. I'm much more interested in coming up with ways of observing them under different contexts. Now, just a quickie on this, um, a quickie primer. Dolphins have large and complex brains. They show behavioral and social complexity. Um, they have long-lasting relationships like us, like great apes, like elephants. Uh, much of many, they live in fusion fission type social structures like us, like elephants, like great apes and dogs, by the way, which means they make, they make alliances, those alliances break apart, they're long lasting, they come together, they break apart. They also work cooperatively and they're interdependent in many of their activities from mating to foraging uh, to protecting their young. They also show empathic behavior, caregiving for others. And there's some question at how, what level this operates. Um, and they also show cogn com comparable cognitive uh, capacities with chimpanzees in problem solving and memory tasks. And they've been, uh, they've been trained to comprehend sentences uh, in a lab uh, that was done, uh, in work that was done by my colleague Lou Herman with, at his lab. He talked about sentence comprehension, symbolic 
uh, gestural comprehension, but they hadn't been taught to do productive work. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about that in a while. So let's just talk about these large and complex brains for a moment. Dolphin brains are, are larger than our brains. They weigh ma more than our brains. They come in at about 800, 1,800 grams as compared to our 1,300 gram brains. And you can see they're highly convoluted. These are big encephalized brains. Uh, what's interesting about the dolphin brain is that, first of all, they're second, in, they're second uh, only to the human brain in, abs in relative size. So our brains are about seven times the size they need to be to run a body of our size are the gorillas, chimpanzees, and uh, orangutans run between 1.8 and 2.4 in terms of relative size. This is called the encephalization quotient. We've heard a good deal of discussion about that. And nobody knows quite what that means. It's just another measure to think about it. Dolphins are 4.2, so they have the second largest EQ to us humans. And again, these are really well-developed, complex brains that show areas, uh, they, that show structures that could support complex behavior. So these dolphin brains, do both dolphin brains and human brains evolved to be large and complex, but in different ways. I'm not gonna go into that more. I'm not a neuro, uh, anatomist, but we can talk about some of those things if we have time later. Um, what I'm going to do, as I said, is I want to focus on behavior in the time I have today. I want to talk about three studies that we did with dolphins over uh, the past 30 years. Um, I just pulled some examples going from very simple behaviors that suggested to me and my colleagues more complex self-aware behavior or awareness of what they're doing. Uh, we, we're going to talk about some work we did with a very simple a piece of apparatus, a mirror, and then some new stuff, some new work we're doing with touch screens that was uh, driven by earlier work where we give dolphins interactive keyboards. So to start with, dolphins are non-handed, but they're manipulative and creative. You don't have to have hands uh, to manipulate, and we see when we do our field work at, in Bimini in Belize, which we do as well as conducting captive studies at New York Aquarium, where I used to be, and at, at um, the National Aquarium, where our lab is now, they will carry objects like seaweed, uh, my colleagues, uh, Janet Mann and her, her, her uh, collaborators have shown the non-handed dolphin uses tools. So we know many animals use tools. We've heard about that over the course of the past two days. Um, dolphins do too. They carry sponges. They seems to protect them, their rostrums when they're foraging in uh, abrasive substrates. But here's one that, here's a very interesting behavior. First day I got my video camera a long time ago, a dolphin went to the bottom of the pool, Shiloh, she blew this beautiful bubble ring from her blowhole. She took a very stereotypic position, I'm gonna show it to you again, going down to the bottom of each pool, doing a little head jerk, blowing out this ring. Look at her swimming around the ring, not touching it, because if she touches it, it breaks. It's made of air, it comes from their blowhole, which are their nostrils. And then we watched this suite of behaviors uh, with the, blow, with the uh, bubble ring. Here she blows one, another one catches up, and she swims through the hoop. Now, <laughs> dolphins play, but, and animals play, and there's good reason, good reason that it really helps them in, in other things they're gonna do in their life. But this was the first evidence that we had for dolphins creating their own object of play and interacting with it. And it's been seen in many different situations with dolphins. Now, I'm gonna show you another dolphin at the National Aquarium. This is two and a half year old Bailey, who was born there. She's learned on her own how to blow a different kind of ring. No one in the pool was doing it this way that we saw. Can anybody figure this out? She's blowing the air out of her blowhole, but what is she doing? Watch this. She uses her tail. You can barely see her blowing it out of her blowhole, but she learned, and we didn't watch her learn this, um, that if she hits it with her tail, she can do this. She did this for 45 minutes straight. And this talks about attention span, and I would make the argument that this is intentional conscious behavior as the other as the other bubble rings I showed you. Now, I said I was gonna talk about the use of another object, the mirror, and we recognize our faces in the mirror. In fact, mirror self-recognition, often called MSR, has been considered one index of self-awareness and uh, one of the hallmarks of our level of consciousness. And I'm gonna use the term self-awareness and consciousness in a loose inner, you know, way right now. I'm gonna switch between the two. But I wanna just say that self-awareness is not a unitary ability. There are many ways of being self-aware. I have a dog that is 
self-aware. He does not recognize himself in a mirror, nor does my cat, but they're not bumping into walls. They're not walking into furniture. They're aware of their own body, and I suspect he has appropriate, some level of proprioceptive awareness, an awareness of himself in space and others. But reactions to mirrors have become a well-established and documented reliable behavioral index of developing self-awareness and existing self-awareness in both human and non-human animals. And just to sort of unpack this quickly, the ability to recognize oneself in a mirror takes a lot of cognitive processing. First, you have to pay selective attention, and we talked about that yesterday as one index of consciousness, selective attention to the mirror. Secondly, once one pays attention to themselves in a mirror, and most animals that do, if they do, think it's a conspecific. They don't understand it's themselves, even if they're in front of a mirror for a long time. They show social behavior. But once one sh starts attending to the mirror, and it's the interpretation of information. So we have perception, sensory perception, then interpretation. We're getting into perception now. And then also it requires the mental capacity, but also the motivation to want to use a mirror to see yourself. Because if I stood in front of a mirror and just didn't care, any observer of my behavior couldn't say anything about changes in my behavior from the beginning to the end or what that might infer. So in babies, it emerges between 18 to 24 months of age. That's the sort of median range. And what's interesting is developmental studies of children show that the, the MSR actually emerges uh, along with in, uh, increasing social awareness, awareness of others, as well as sensory motor development. So we see it emerging with pro-social behavior and empathy, caring for others, but also this developing proprioceptive awareness seems to be critical, understanding where your body is, your body movements, and having feedback about that. So mere self-recognition, again, is a rare ability, once thought to be exclusively human, but then it was shown by Gordon Gallup and Danny Povinelli and others in all of the great apes. Now, you might say, well, how do you figure this out? How do you know if mere self-recognition is developing? Does this dog know it's himself, or is he thinking bad dog about that guy in the mirror? So the basic approach that was done by, by, uh, by Gordon Gallup was designed. You, s you expose an animal to a mirror. They show three stages of emerging behavior for those who go on to show it. I'm going quickly because I think many of you may be familiar with this. They first show exploratory behavior near the mirror so, and social behavior, contingency testing much. Whoops, let me show you Groucho here. I think it makes the point where there's this repetitive and often unusual set of behaviors that are exhibited. This is where the light bulb goes on, where the organism, be it human, Dolphin will start to show, or chimpanzee will start to be testing those one to one contingencies between their own behavior and that guy in the mirror. Once that happens, you start seeing self directed behavior, directed behavior towards oneself at the mirror, looking in your mouth, looking in your eyes, looking at parts of your body that you can't see without the mirror. That in itself is considered self directed behavior or evidence of mirror self recognition. Gordon Gallup stated this from the beginning, but he went on to say, let's do the mark test. And what Gallup developed for chimpanzees is putting a visible mark that can only be seen in the mirror, however, uh, on an animal. And when they get in front of the mirror, do they touch the mark? And they do, they do it more so that when they're at the mirror than prior to that. This was a, a test that was independently also developed by Amsterdam. It's called the Rouge Test for tests with children. So that's basically what we did when we tried with dolphins, because given they had so many characteristics, like chimpanzees, my colleague Laurie Marino and I decided to try it. So I'm just going to go through the, the results here real quickly. Uh, we marked, this is Presley, we marked two captive-born dolphins at the New York Aquarium. And this is just a little glimpse of what they did. So they started showing the kind of groucho behavior, this kind of unusual behavior. You have to know your animals. You ha I've been studying these guys for 30 years. So you have to know what the normal social behavior is. This dolphin was marked on his head, and he zips over to the mirror. I've cut this, obviously, just to show little clips, because we have short time. This is all unusual behavior you do not see in baseline. We also marked the animals in out their outdoor pools and predicted that if we, if once they were marked, and this dolphin was marked under his chin in an area he had never been marked before, that he would zip down to where the mirror was. You'll see it in the pool in just a minute. If I can get my pointer out of here. The mirror is way, whoops. The mirror is right down here. He zips down and positions himself at the mirror. And you're going to see he's now stretching his neck to expose the marked part of the body. And um, 
just for time's sake, I'm going to move ahead, but he was there. Notice the other dolphin is not doing it. Yet when he's marked, he, he orients his body. We marked them in nine different places so that the, th the situation was, do they go to the mirror and show that exhibit, orient their marked part of their body right away? And they both did. So this dolphin, by the way, you're seeing this dolphin using the mirror. He's backed away from the mirror. He could not see himself close up. And you can see him kind of spotting. It almost reminds me of a ballet dancer spotting, looking in the mirror, spinning, spotting. It's not a trained behavior. This was an un another unusual behavior. So in summary, two dolphins used mirrors to view marked parts of their body and pass the mark test. Um, and what was it's so interesting is that they both, uh, both dolphins exhibited the same progression of behaviors that I told you about, those three, per, those st three stages of behavior the children show. And um, even some of the same types of behaviors, they were really interested in looking inside their mouths, looking at their eyes closely. Um, I know my daughter did the same thing in a mirror, and I remember using mirrors when I was a little kid. I wanted to see what's going on in my mouth. You know, they, it's really interesting to see these same areas of interest, looking at their genitals. Kids do it, dolphins did it. Um, so we see that the progression of behavioral stages and the types of behaviors. Um, and that was striking. And again, these were our first findings showing that non-human primate species uh, a non-human primate species could do it. And what's particularly interesting, I think, for us here today is that here uh, we have two species separated by tens of million years of independent evolution um, involving in radically different environments and with these different trends in brain organization showing this rare ability. And again, they've been, we've been, the last common ancestor was about 95 million years ago. And Again, my colleague Lori Marino and I made this case that for cognitive convergence and this ability. I just want to mention that my colleague Josh Plotnick, who's here with us today, and Franz Duval and I did a subsequent study with Asian elephants and, again, showed very similar stages, the same stages of behavior and even same behaviors with another large-brained, highly social animal, the Asian elephants. Um, we've done subsequent tests with elephants that are in preparation now, showing more individuals can, of elephants and Asian elephants can do it. And um, I want to talk to you about a study. So here we have sort of the gang of animals who are doing it. And by the way, we have our first avian species. A study was done in 2008 by Pryor et al. showing that magpies, members of the crow family, showed very similar behaviors. Large, complex brains, similar EQs to that in chimps. Um, so I just want to tell you about one study we just, another study we just did. I'm going to go through this very quickly. We asked, at what age does MSR emerge in young dolphins? And the reason we asked this is the dolphins show our precocious sociomotor and social development. They have advanced muscle development, locomotor behavior that's been reported by others. Um, in the first weeks of life, they they're born after a 12-month gestation period. They have to keep up with mom. They have to synchronize their behavior. They have an early development of proprioception and advanced social awareness. They're inter interacting with others at a very in the first few weeks of life. So we predicted that they would also show precocious development. So I'm going to cut to the chase. Okay, I did this with my co with my uh, doctoral student Rachel Morrison. We taught we looked at two captive-born bottlenose dolphins. We started with one male who was 14 months, 13 days old, and a much younger animal at 13 months, uh, almost four months old, Bailey. We put a one-way mirror up at the National Aquarium. We let them observe themselves. We recorded all their behavior. It was a three-year longitudinal study where we studied eight dolphins at that facility. But we, in this, I'm focusing on the two young animals. Here's Foster, the 14-month-old. First day, looking at his himself, testing contingencies. We can look through this mirror. That's him squeaking, not with his vocalizations. That's his body squeaking against the window. And they had been exposed to reflective surfaces in their pool, so we don't feel that they were naive. Here's Bailey, the young animal. She's a little bit older here, showing self-directed behavior. I just want to give you a variety of the kinds of behaviors we saw. In the end, we found that Bailey showed the emergence of self-directed behavior earlier than children. Again, 5.5 months. We actually saw evidence at about four months, but we're saying 5.5 to 7, where we really feel that comfort level. Foster, we didn't ch test till he was older, so we can't say when he would have shown it. And both dolphins passed the mark test, but we, didn't, we weren't able to mark them until they were much older. So these, uh, these dates that you're seeing here are not indicative of when they actually did it. OK, I'm just going to finish up. Um, by saying that we found similar developmental correlates with onset of MSR in children and dolphins. 
uh, dolphins, and dolphins' precocious sensory motor and social development may be contributing factors for their early onset of their abilities. I was going to talk about this other study. I'm going to just take one more second, okay? Um, we, we, I was very interested in what would happen if we gave dolphins an underwater keyboard. The reason I wanted to do this is I said, I don't want to train dolphins. I wanted to see what would happen if we gave them degrees of choice and control. And we developed the underwater keyboard. Dolphins are vocal learners. They show a proclivity for both vocal and behavioral imitation. Here's just a schematic. If they hit a key, they heard a uh, computer-generated whistle, they got a ball. If they had a, hit a different key, they heard a different computer-generated whistle and got a rub. They could ask for different objects and activities. It was like a giant vending machine for dolphins. We put the, we put the keyboard in the pool. I'm just going fast. This is what it looked like from a dolphin. Underwater, they could hit a key, they'd hear, <laughs> they'd get a ball. If they hit another key, they would get a rub. What we found was they started to imitate the computer-generated sounds without any reinforcement from us. This was all self-reinforcing behavior. They had control, and we know from the literature from the 50s, control is important to animals. They did more. They showed spontaneous associative learning. We talked about that, perhaps as an indicator of consciousness, and behavioral accordance. What that means is they would whistle, ball, or ring. Let's say a pan would whistle ring, and he would be moving toward a ring, and then he would play with it. It was much like what we'd see with a young child in early stages of development, where they might get a toy and be saying, a little girl might hold a truck and say truck while she's playing with it. This is what the kinds of behaviors we were getting. We also, I just want to mention, we, the dolphins started using these signals in their own repertoire. So here is rub, followed by a dolphin's contact call. It's kind of a, the call they, an individualized call each dolphin uses. And they started using these on their own, and turning to us to get rubs. So here's a dolphin whistling rub with its contact call. They also combined two signals for ring and ball on their own. We never knew when they were doing this. We didn't know about it until after we analyzed the tapes each day. It was in the context of playing a game they invented in the second year of our study with a ball and a ring together. So they started combining them, and they used it the whole second year of the study. So I, we can talk about this in more detail, but this was very nice evidence for the emergence of self-organized learning. And my closing slide is we were very limited by technology. Um, I should say slides. Uh, we could barely keep up with the dolphins. My colleagues and I developed an interactive touch screen for dolphins. It's dolphin safe. It's optically detected touches. Uh, my colleague Marcelo Magnasco uh, at the Laboratory for Integrative Neuroscience and Physics and Biology at Rockefeller University and his lab are my collaborators. And we're working at the National Aquarium in Baltimore right now where we have installed an underwater touch screen four by eight foot touch screen. Uh, it's gonna function, hopefully, much like the keyboard, whoa, where the dolphins hit a key, they get an object, we're gonna be able to track them visually and acoustically. And I just wanna show you the first session where we just tested the keyboard. We wanted to see what our dolphin would do. These are non-technological animals. They've never seen or interacted with any technology in this environment. These are not the keyboard dolphins. This is kinda like whack-a-mole for dolphins. And this is a, a foster, a 14-year-old dolphin. I'm sorry, nine-year-old dolphin. And if you look at the bottom screen, the red dots are where he's hitting. He hit all the fish on the screen. So non-technological, yet without training, he seems to be interested, paying selective attention, and it seems to be self-reinforcing. And I'll stop there. Thanks. We're going to defer questions until we've heard all three. That's a bad idea. Let's take 10 minutes. We tried that yesterday. The speakers all agreed to that. So as the pref as a stated preference. So um, so anyway. So so yeah. So that's what we're doing. Uh, but we need Brian to set up now. So uh, which should only just take a minute. So I'll introduce I'll introduce Brian. Uh, well, he's setting up. So Brian is professor of evolutionary anthropology at Duke University, where he studies uh, both dogs and primate cognition. He, he's also the founder of, uh, of something, a business, a website, an NGO. I don't know what it is. It's called Dognition. And you can go on the web and find out how intelligent your dog is.
no, 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 this is the right chord. We tried it before, but I don't know why it's not coming in. Ah, there we go. I was like, I can sing, but... Okay, it's a great pleasure to be with you all today. And just in time, my voice came back. I have two kids and uh, I've been suffering from, I don't know what, but I've had a very raspy voice. So it might come back, I apologize in advance. Um, uh, thank you to the organizers, folks inviting me. It is a real pleasure to be able to present a little bit of my work. Uh, I study um, uh, cognitive evolution, actually, uh, and I'm very interested in human evolution in particular. Uh, and uh, the underlying assumption of my work is that if we don't want to understand humans and what it is to be human, you have to first understand what it is to be not human. And we've heard a lot about that uh, over the last couple of days. Um, so uh, I don't study con consciousness, and I'm looking forward to the discussion uh, section uh, uh, because I think maybe I do study con consciousness. And uh, I need all these philosophers to help me understand. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. So, so what I want to do, though, is tell you what I think I'm studying uh, and uh, give you an example. Uh, this is a cognitive problem that was given to a, a chimpanzee named Yo-Yo. Uh, she's seven years old. And uh, we have um, put uh, the equivalent of the World Series title for the New York Yankees, or maybe even more remarkable, the Mets, uh, down in the bottom of this PVC pipe. Uh, she, uh, there's, there's peanuts here that she could potentially get, except for we've taken all the tools that she might normally use that chimpanzees are famous for using away from her. Obviously, there's everything in her room that she would need to be uh, housed and, and be happy, uh, but her normal sticks or stones uh, aren't available. So the question, the challenge for you and for her is how do you solve this problem? She had never seen this problem when this video was taken. Uh, and she is going to solve the problem within uh, a few seconds. So the challenge is, and I'm sure most of you know the answer. If you do, don't yell it out. But if you have an answer, uh, then that's wonderful. Uh, if you don't, you've got a few more seconds to figure it out. I'm trying to give you some time. All right, here we go. How do you get the peanut out of the tube? You can't rip it off the wall. What are you going to do? She's got the answer. She has a brain a third the size of yours. So I love this. So I love this as an example of cognition because this is the thing that excites me is when you give an animal a novel problem they've never seen before, they spontaneously solve it. And it gives us the potential to uh, ask the question, are they using inferential reasoning uh, to uh, figure out a solution? OK, and by the way, if you're wondering, there is a second solution to this problem. The males that solve this all peed into the tube. OK. So my approach to studying animal psychology rejects the notion that there's some unidimensional measure of cognition, that there's just some general learning mechanism uh, that there's different quantitative amounts of across different species. Instead, uh, I actually think that there's many different types of cognition. We don't even know how many there are. Uh, and part of my job is to go out and try to characterize those different kinds of cognitive abilities. And instead of a world where I'm just trying to measure sort of quantitatively how animals can learn, I'm trying to figure out what kind of cognitive abilities they are and what their cognitive profiles are. So for instance, here's five different types of cognitive abilities. If I compare two species, the question isn't, um, are they better or worse overall in some general sense, but actually, uh, how do they compare on each of these different types of cognitive abilities? And how has evolution shaped them to have more or less flexibility in these different uh, cognitive abilities uh, so that they can survive and reproduce and have their own unique cognitive profile uh, that has been generated uh, through millions of years of natural selection. So the world to me is, and I get this, asked this question all the time by reporters, uh, which is the smartest species? And it, uh, I drive them crazy because I'll never answer the question because I'm thinking of this picture. If you ask me which of these species is the genius up here, well, I'd say they're all geniuses. And I always answer reporters and say, asking me which one's smarter is like asking me which, which is a better tool, a hammer or a screwdriver. What problems are we trying to solve in the real world? Because if you're trying to remember 10,000 locations, give me a Clark's Nutcracker. If you're trying to find something underwater, don't give me a chimpanzee. <laughs> give me a dolphin. Uh, and on and on and on. Each of these species have their own uh, uh, flexibility and unique cognitive profile. 
while there, of course, is going to be um, uh, a commonality to many of the uh, cognitive abilities animals have, uh, I think they each have their own unique cognitive ability. So using this uh, theoretical framework, I started uh, my career uh, in facing this quote from my uh, mentor, uh, Mike Tomasello and Joseph Call, uh, where in their 1997 book, they summarized the entire literature on primate cognition and concluded that primates, uh, there was no experimental evidence uh, that primates had uh, any ability to understand uh, the psychological states of others, uh, and that yes, they can respond to uh, others and learn behavioral responses and maybe even understand uh, animacy. Uh, there was no understanding of things like intentionality or beliefs, uh, and certainly uh, no ability to understand false beliefs. So what I want to do is just quickly tell you where we are now. Uh, 20 years later, uh, I, first I want to share, uh, uh, just summarize work on metacognition. So we know now that uh, apes know when they need to search for more information in different contexts, uh, when decisions are risky or uncertain, uh, when choices involve risk versus ambiguity. Oops. We also ha have evidence that uh, they know when something was hidden. Uh, how the value of what is hidden changes with time. Uh, what they experienced even a year before was a recent demonstration. I'm sorry, I can't tell you the experimental details. You'll have to read the papers or ask me in the, in the question and answer section. Uh, and then in terms of theory of mind, what we've figured out is, or what we've been able to find evidence for, is that chimpanzees understand what others can, can and can't see, uh, what they intend or uh, they don't intend to do, what others know and don't know. There's even the beginnings of evidence that maybe they have some ability for implicit false belief understanding. Uh, in terms of cooperation, believe it or not, when I began, there was not uh, any experimental evidence that chimpanzees could coordinate or synchronize their uh, behavior with each other. Uh, so now we know uh, when they know when, when help is needed, either self or others, who is skilled and unskilled, and they understand the leverage they have in a dyadic interaction. Okay, so chimpanzee is pretty sophisticated. That's very exciting, um, and I think we made a lot of progress. Um, but in a sea of similarity, and go back to uh, the point I was trying to make that each species is unique, surfing in a sea of similarity are real differences between uh, non-human great apes and humans. And it's actually quite exciting, and I feel much more confident about talking about differences between humans and non-humans when we have made so much progress on seeing so much flexibility. So for instance, this is a, the first comparison, longitudinal comparison of a large sample of human infants uh, and uh, infant bonobos and chimpanzees. Uh, and what we did is we gave them a battery of cognitive tasks. Um, none of them involved any controls, they were just measures of their ability to solve these tasks that in other contests we had the controls to show that these were good measures of uh, understanding others in some uh, flexible way. Uh, and we also had tests of physical reasoning. And we gave all the kids and all the non-human apes this battery of tests every year for three years. And what you see is a very different picture in development. So while uh, kids, uh, develop very rapidly, their social uh, skill, and all the game, most of the games represented here involve cooperation and communication with others. Uh, you see an explosion in the ability to cooperate and communicate with others in these games in our own children, in non-human apes, there's a much slower developmental trajectory. They do learn how to do most of these games eventually um, uh, to some degree, but you don't see this developmental trajectory. On the physical cognition side, there's no difference at two years of age. So what we think is there's, while you have this incredibly underdeveloped brain, uh, and if you think about the state that the brain is in uh, at two and a half years when these kids were assessed, it's remarkable that they are doing so much uh, with um, their social cognition. I mean, having had two kids and seeing them try to solve physical problems in the world, even today, five and six years of age, while when they were three, they were already figuring out what I could see and couldn't see, it's remarkable how early these social skills come online. We don't see that developmental pattern in non-human apes, and I think that's really important for thinking about the evolution of culture, language, and maybe why human uh, consciousness is uh, different uh, in some way than other animals, potentially. All right, but I don't want you to think that because those differences exist uh, that uh, somehow we are completely unique and that, we're, that uh, uh, it's hopeless to explain their evolution. 
So what we did is we compared uh, a group of uh, dogs with a variety of rearing histories and backgrounds uh, on uh, eight games. Four of them were social, four of them were non-social, that were the same games that we'd given the human kids and chimpanzees. Uh, and we looked at uh, how they performed, just mean performance in terms of understanding uh, and solving these different problems. And what you see is that if you've got a physical problem in the physical world, don't ask your dog. This is, you know, if you're above 50% uh, somewhere in this region, you're doing better, uh, you're doing okay. Um, basically, we give them a problem and repeat it, and then you see how many times over the different trials they get it correct. Uh, and dogs are guessing on most of these games that have to do with the physical world. But the big surprise is while we see uh, young children really outstripping other non-human grade apes, Dogs are the species we tested that are most like our children. Um, and so that's pretty fascinating, but it even gets more fun because when we look at individual differences, this is the pattern of individual differences in human kids on the physical and social tasks. What you'd predict is if we really were measuring social things, performance on the social task would be related to one another across individuals. If we were really measuring a domain of physical cognition, those tasks would be related to one another uh, in performance. So we find that in human kids. Uh, we don't find that in chimpanzees. It seems that they are solving these problems in a very different way uh, when you look at individual differences. But look at our dear, beloved dog, Sophie, back there. There is a dog in the audience, I believe. You can be very proud. Um, here is the uh, uh, cognitive profile looking at individual differences of dogs. So um, if you were to ask me what species is most like a two-year-old when it comes to cooperative communication, the thing that we think is the crucial feature to acquire language and culture, I would say actually our dogs are pretty good models. Okay, so then that sets up this exciting opportunity, just like the octopi. Everybody was saying octopus. I swore, I thought it was octopi. Anyway, so just one of the other vocabulary words I've struggled over, uh, with uh, the last uh, two days. So uh, apparently, Dan Dennett just shook his head, so I'm supposed to say octopus, and I will the rest of my life. Okay, so, um, so uh, this is me hanging out with some wolves, and it really, to me, is a, a nice picture of uh, dog evolution. We think that dogs actually evolved through natural selection. Uh, it wasn't that we chose dogs, they chose us. Uh, in a population of dogs, those that were friendliest uh, actually had a reproductive advantage. I could go into the story of why, uh, but I, I don't have time because I wanna uh, get to the next part of the talk. But basically the idea is there was individual variability and friendliness, and because of Dmitry Belayev's work with the foxes that I went and studied, we were able to demonstrate that selection for friendliness is related to the emergence of cooperative communicative abilities. Uh, so uh, if you want to get from here to there, actually you just select for friendliness, and as a byproduct you get human-like cooperative communication. All right, I've, I've actually um, summarized this hypothesis and extended it uh, to try to talk about late human evolution in particular. Uh, I have an annual review in psychology paper that just came out this year arguing uh, that survival of the friendliest is uh, actually a big part of our uh, species story late in human evolution. Uh, and actually, it does help explain dehumanization as well. Uh, so it, it, I think it ex helps explain the paradox of kindness and cruelty uh, that is on display uh, when we see our species interact with one another. Okay, but my favorite example of survival of the friendliest I want to turn to now are our other closest relative that uh, unfortunately we don't usually get to hear enough about. So uh, I want to ask you, if you won $200 at a casino, you've got this discretionary money, you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, how many people here uh, with this $200 they didn't know they were going to have, maybe you were on Oprah's show and she said, look under your seat and there's $200. There isn't, I'm sorry guys, but just imagine. <laughs> Raise your hand. How many people would take uh, a, a friend out or somebody you know with that $200 and do something fun? Or how many people would find a complete stranger you've never met before and do something together and spend that money on that person? Okay, friends and family. All right, complete stranger, somebody you've never met before. All right, I am in New York. Okay. <laughs> so we asked that question to uh, Bonobos. Uh, and this is Saki. She's a four-year-old uh, bonobo. She lives at Lola Yal Bonobo. She's an orphan of the bushmeat trade. Before breakfast, we gave her some food, and we said, do you want to just eat all the food, or do you want to open the door and let somebody in and share food? If I'd done this study with chimpanzees, the title of the paper would have been titled, Chimpanzees Eat Food. <laughs> what we found was that bonobos would voluntarily open the door and allow another bonobo, it's fun, to share 
um, come in and share the food. But then what's interesting is we gave them the same choice I gave you. We said, okay, now that we know you will share, who do you prefer to share with? And what we found was that only 10% of the time when they shared, they opened the door for a group mate. 50% of the time, they opened for somebody they'd never met. So uh, that was quite remarkable. Um, but we thought, well, maybe, and we as uh, uh, Jin, uh, Kenji Tan and I, Kenji Tan is the first author here, we thought, well, maybe it's just because they want that physical interaction. They are bonobos, after all, wink, wink. So, so maybe they just want to meet a stranger and, you know, have a, have a blind date and, you know, uh, expand their social network. So what about if we take that possibility away? They just have to be helpful towards a stranger, but they don't really get anything in return. We gave our subjects, the guy climbing up here, uh, a toy. You can play with the toy, or you can go help this poor hapless bonobo who doesn't have access uh, to this banana, you just have to remove this peg. And in terms of the, the subject here, the subject in some conditions, they could actually use gestures. We, we opened the, the mesh so they could reach through and sort of say, help me, help me. And then in another condition, they were unable to ask for help to see if it really was proactive if the bonobos actually did anything. So here's a video um, of the hanging banana study. I don't know, I don't have a funny name for it yet, but uh, it just came out in scientific reports. Um, so here's our guy, he can't get the banana. This is when all the, they can't gesture, so he's just kind of running around. Darn it, I can't get that banana. He can't ask for help, he's just kind of stuck. And the other bonobos over here playing with a rope and a toy that they've never had a chance to play with before, so you know, who knows if he's actually gonna come help. So I give up, I give up. Yeah. Oh, my hero has arrived. <laughs> all right. So what we found was that uh, in a control condition where the bonobo was still there, the subject was still there, but you couldn't help um, them obtain food, uh, you see very little releasing the peg, and uh, you see more releasing the peg, regardless of whether you can um, uh, gesture or not, although you see a slight reduction. Now, it is important to note that we gave them eight trials, and they only did it about three times. So I'm not trying to say that they're going out of their way to break the bank to help but you do see evidence of, and importantly, helping strangers. Uh, and um, so this is one of the first demonstrations of animals helping strangers in this way. Um, so because it's, uh, I really debated what to talk about. At the, this is my last uh, talk, I mean, uh, study I'm gonna uh, share with you. I really debated about what to end on, but since uh, this was about consciousness, uh, this, was, uh, this is a, a study where we studied uh, contagious yawning uh, in bonobos, and uh, it's in that same paper, actually, the one in Scientific Reports. And basically, we showed bonobos videos. We created what uh, Kenji Tan, Dr. Tan, calls uh, bonobo TV. Uh, and they watch bonobo TV here. Uh, and what was on TV was pretty boring, but uh, it was interesting to, from our perspective. Uh, we either showed them uh, a, a group mate that was yawning or just staring into the TV. Uh, as a control, or we showed them a stranger yawning uh, or a control condition uh, as with the group mate. And uh, the reason we did this is because social, or sorry, contagious yawning it has been linked in people, and I love it, there are people yawning in the back as I say this. Um, so <laughs> contagious yawning has been linked to social, the strength of social bonds between people uh, and between different animals. And it's uh, been pretty well demonstrated, uh, especially in primates, and we knew bonobos have the same effect. But what had been found was that when you present to chimpanzees stranger yawning, they do not contagiously yawn but they do contagiously yawn for group mates. So when we did this with bonobos, we actually found that they contagiously yawn for strangers. So uh, if this is some kind, we called it an implicit measure, uh, maybe it's unconscious, uh, um, uh, maybe they don't have control of this response, I would imagine. Um, so I just threw this one into the grist mill for fun to see what people thought. Um, so uh, I would say that there is a species that shares 99% of our DNA that is highly xenophobic, uh, that's the chimpanzee, but we also have our other closest relative is highly xenophilic. And so it sets up a beautiful opportunity to study the evolution of that. Uh, if you're interested in the explanation for why bonobos are so wonderful, uh, there's a new book you can check out. Uh, it, just can't, it just literally went on sale. Uh, it's an edited volume with 20 chapters on the latest research on bonobos. Uh, and I would argue that if you want to know humans and you want to know chimpanzees, you now must know Bonobo. Okay, thank you very much.
All right. Um, so our final speaker in this session uh, is our own Joseph Ledoux, who is known to the world uh, as a professor of neuroscience here and known to the world as uh, an extremely important contributor to work on memory and emotion, but is known to us as the founder of the legendary band, the Amygdaloids. <laughs> However, I think today it will be his former identity that will probably be most in display. You never know. <laughs> you never know. No, with Joe. Oops, did I just screw up? The no, I think we're okay. Okay, uh, do I have the right to 30 seconds? Dale, you know any jokes? <laughs> okay, we're going to let it go. So we're gonna, I'm going to be talking about uh, fear as a test case, case about uh, emotions and animal consciousness. Um, and fear is a good model to, don't start my time, Dave. <laughs> uh, fear is a good model to use because uh, we've, it's been studied so much, both as a psychological process, but also as a uh, neuro, uh, neurobiological mechanism, and also uh, in terms of um, good uh, p problems that people have clinically with fear, obviously. So that's where we're going to go here. And I want to just start with the, a kind of scientific problem where you've got uh, something going in and something going out. And you, the question is, how does the, the black box or the white circle in this case, what's going on in the black box or white circle? So if it's a threat, then we have these defense responses like freezing, flight, avoidance, physiological arousal. Uh, our best assumption is that it's fear that's causing these things to happen. But if we look inside the black box, what we see, and that what, that's what I'll be talking about today, is that the threat activates the defense responses by way of a subcortical defense circuit. But fear is not, uh, uh, the experience of fear is not part of that chain of events. Uh, at least that's what I will try to argue today. So, um, you know, there are two basic principles every scientist is, is taught or should be taught. Don't confuse causation with correlation. And I think we have a causation-correlation problem here where it's obvious to us that our, uh, when we are afraid, we're often acting afraid and our heart is beating and so forth. So we think these things are uh, one and the same. But when we have the opportunity to kind of analyze what's going on in the brain where these things are controlled, we see that there's some differences here. And also, we have to also separate findings from interpretation. So the finding is that, that a threat elicits, say, freezing, but the interpretation is that fear is responsible. So, um, you know, intuition is necessary to, to initiate research, but shouldn't dictate the interpretation. So here we have uh, rats frozen in fear, for example. Since, two th since 1960, there have been over 2,000 publications of freezing in fear. Uh, researchers, and some of these quotes could be taken from my papers uh, over the years, Freezing was used as a measure of fear. Fear memory was assessed by measuring freezing. Rats were frozen in fear. Repetition of the threat with no consequence reduced freezing and thus fear. So these are some of the species in which this has been claimed. Uh, I won't go through the details. Um, but what's the scientific foundation uh, for this? And it's usually analogy with human behavior. So people will freeze when they are threatened in some way. Uh, and Darwin also picked up on this and used it as the basis for, uh, this is part of his, his, the basis for his claim that fear is a state of mind that humans have inherited from animals and that underlies behavioral responses to danger. Uh, Romanes, his uh, protege, uh, said behavior is the ambassador of the mind. And there was a lot of uh, kind of rampant anthropomorphism in the late 19th century, and this is what led to behaviorism. Now, it's interesting that the behaviorist eliminated mental states like fear from the causal chain, but retained the mental state terms. So fear became an intervening variable that accounted for the relation between danger and behavior. So here we have fear, the intervening variable. I have it in, in, small, ca in small letters, non-capital letters, uh, to separate it from what's happened post-behaviorism where fear has become a capital letter word. Um, now, you know, the behaviors had their problems, obviously, but uh, they were very good at policing the language. And 
I'm not saying that that was necessarily a good thing, but right now nobody's policing the language and you can say whatever you want. So um, the basic emotions theory of, uh, uh, is, has helped revive this idea of fears as a cause of behavior. So he, this is a Darwinian-based theory. Humans have inherited certain emotions like fear, joy, sadness from animal ancestors, and each emotion is wired into an affect program uh, which is a distinct circuit, hypothetical circuit, that controls these responses, but also controls feelings. So the arousal of the, uh, the feeling is what causes the responses. So fear in capital letters uh, through the affect program. And each basic emotion has its affect program, those little colored things above the, the fearful faces and other faces there. Uh, this, this is Paul Ekman's uh, face showing all these emotions. Uh, and it was also uh, popularized, and uh, this movie was basically an advertisement for um, basic emotions theory. Uh, it was very popular. It's a great movie, but I think the theory is wrong. Um, so why is Janet Lee screaming? You know, with, she's afraid. Yes, she's afraid, but is she screaming because she afra she's afraid? That's the, uh, the big question. So the, um, my work has kind of gone down the road of implicating the amygdala in, in fear. Uh, and I've often been said at being introduced in lectures uh, that uh, Ledoux has shown the amygdala's role in the experience of fear, and I've never shown that. So I, I, part of what I want to do today is try to set the record straight on what it is I think I've shown and what, uh, what's wrong with what I've been accused of showing. So the, you know, the amygdala, this is the basic amygdala, the basic emotion theory uh, centered on the amygdala. So the classic findings, damage to the amygdala in, ha in animals or humans eliminates behavioral and physiological responses to threat. The interpretation is eliminating the responses by amygdala damage means that the amygdala damage eliminates fear, and without fear you don't have the response. Same thing with imaging, amygdala activation reflects the state of fear, and fear leads to the responses. And so without, and the reason the amygdala is activated and heart rate is uh, increasing and the hands are sweating is because of the state of fear. So what's wrong with this? Well, behavioral and physiological responses don't readily correlate with subjectively experienced fear when you measure them, uh, and they should if they're all products of the same fear circuit in the amygdala. Medications used to treat fear and anxiety can have greater effects on the behavioral responses or physiological arousal than on subjective feelings. Threats elicit both amygdala activity and behavioral and physiological responses in the absence of subjective awareness of the stimulus and without any uh, report of a feeling, uh, using subliminal stimulation techniques like masking and so forth, or blindsight patients. Damage to the amygdala interferes with the ability of threats to elicit behavioral and physiological responses, but does not eliminate the feeling of fear. And finally, fear does not have an exclusive contract with the amygdala. Uh, and its predatory defense system, and I'll describe some of these things uh, in a little more detail. So, there was a big surprise to many people when uh, it was reported that uh, a woman with amygdala damage, bilateral amygdala damage, could still feel fear. Headlines, uh, humans can feel terror even if they lack the brain's fear center, scaring the fearless, on and on. So, you know, as neuroscientists, we don't need fear to explain how a circuit in the brain connects a stimulus to a response. You have some learning process that connects that stimulus, and we, and we see this in, in, uh, uh, in people as well, that we can, these responses don't need the amygdala in order to be expressed. Um, this doesn't mean that fear is an Ill, irrelevant construct. It's just not what causes the responses elicited by threats in animals or human studies uh, that measure defensive behaviors and physiological responses controlled by the amygdala. So, I think subjective state terms shouldn't be used to account for responses in animals um, when similar responses don't depend on subjective states in humans. This doesn't mean that animals lack fear experiences, but it does mean that we shouldn't simply use analogy with human responses if we want to scientifically demonstrate these experiences. So there's a difference between the, the question about what underlies defensive behavior and the question about whether animals have some kind of experience when they respond defensively. So many researchers when pressed, and uh, we heard a little bit about this from Marion uh, yesterday, um, say, well, I didn't really mean fear when I said fear. Um, so they, instead, they're talking about this kind of intervening variable, hypothetical, physiological state, where this would be the amygdala, for example, where the threat activates some 
non-subjective physiological state of fear, in other words, just a, a physiological state, again, going back to the behaviors, getting rid of fear, but not the, the word fear, and then you get the fear responses. But when they, um, when they, they talk about in their papers frightened rats using fear, freezing as a measure of fear and so forth, but they don't mean fear. So unless you're in the know, you don't know that fear doesn't mean fear. And it's usually not, uh, it's not explained. So confusion is the result. Psychiatrists think that so-called fear conditioning will solve the problem of anxiety by creating medications and explaining how CBT works, cognitive behavioral therapy. Patients believe this too, and even scientists believe it. So this confusion is built into the conceptual basis of the research, the funding mechanisms, ideas about what underlies these feelings of fear and anxiety, the use of research to develop and test uh, uh, new ways of treating it, and this, uh, the description of the work in the media. So we have the, the big, the capital letter fear, the small letter fear, and what I suggest is instead of calling these uh, things that are going on, say, in the amygdala fear, uh, we should talk about threats activating a defense circuit and controlling defense responses. We don't know the role of fear in, in these cases, and in, in I don't think we can simply rely on the, the behavior to tell us that fear is involved. So why does it matter? So here's a few quotes. Uh, Francis Bacon, scientists should be vigilant and guard against tacitly granting reality th to things simply because we have words for them. Uh, Man learned Kesson, common language is full of quasi-psychological assertions and the language in which these are framed is inadequate. Adams do not study Adams. The fact that man studies himself and that he has, ar has archaic notions which persist in the daily behavior of all men puts a major stumbling block in the path of scientific psychology. Psychologists tended to be sloppy with words and on and on, but this is one of my uh, favorites here. Uh, there's a semantic danger that results when a common language term is used as, as a scientific name for an intervening variable or hypothetical construct. In, some, in, in such a situation, some will be inclined to apply the common meaning. When this happens, the variable or construct becomes infected with the subjective properties that the scientist was trying to avoid. And in the case of fear, the common meaning is often assume, assumed to be the intended meaning. So why does it matter? Let's talk about uh, anxiolytic drug development. So, you know, you go to a pharmaceutical company and they put rats in their favorite uh, thing here, which is the elevated plus maze. Uh, so a behavioral test like this is assumed to induce fear and anxiety. If the drug alters the behavior, it's because fear or anxiety was reduced, and the drug should make people feel less fearful or anxious. But in, uh, since, in, since the 1960s, um, the pharmaceutical industry has been searching for new and better medications. But after 50 years of research, Andrew Witte, CEO of Glasgow Smith Klein, and other CEOs of other companies have concluded that the effort has failed and new investments wouldn't be made because of the low probability of success. Andrew Holmes says, these efforts have been disappointing as promising results with novel agents and rodent studies have very rarely translated into effectiveness in humans. What's the problem? Well, the problem, I think, is the wrong conception of what was being studied. And let's talk about social anxiety to uh, see why I have, what I might mean by this. So a person with social anxiety given an anti-anxiety medication will find it easier to go to the party but still feel anxious while there. So in, in a sense, then the, the patient is disappointed, the drug company is disappointed, the therapist is disappointed, and conclude that the drug's a failure. But the fact is the drug did exactly what it did in the animal studies. It reduced behavioral timidity. The person is e is easier, has, finds it easier to go to the party, just as the animal uh, finds it easier to hang out in the open area of the elevated plus maze where they're exposed to danger. So suppose the patient had a different expectation. Suppose they said, uh, the therapist said, okay, you're going to take this uh, medication and you're going to find that it's a little easier to go to the party. And then while you're at the party, you know, you can step in and be exposed to this kind of threatening situation uh, for a while. And then when you find too, too much, step out, you know, relax, go make a phone call or something, go to the bathroom, and then go back in and do this, use this as a kind of opportunity for self-exposure as long as uh, you can take it. And so then the patient goes back to the th therapist and says, yes, that, that really helped, that worked. And I was e it was easier to go to the party next time, and I did more, and it helped again. Um, so if, if the patient had the right expectation, everybody would have been happier. Um, so here's my opinion, that specific beliefs, thoughts, attitudes, or worries can't be changed by medications. 
Uh, medications chan can change these hardwired systems and that control defensive behaviors and physiological arousal. Um, and it's sort of like turning down the volume of the radio. It lowers the level, but it doesn't change the music. So medications are useful, sometimes they're necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, the only way to change a conscious, consciously experienced fear or anxiety experience itself is to change the experience itself. Uh, and that will require some kind of psychotherape psychotherapeutic interaction. It's not something that you can do with the medication alone. Still, if you don't change the pathological behavior in the hyperarousal, the fear and anxiety will come back. So both have to be addressed, either through medication or through uh, exposure therapy or other means, but they both have to be addressed. So there are two systems involved here in the way I see it. Uh, we have a, a, a cognitive network in the cortex and subcortical systems like the amygdala and bed nucleus of the stria terminalis and other things that are detecting the threat and controlling the responses. Um, but the drugs are designed to work subcortically on these behavioral and physiological responses while the people are feeling fearful or anxious here. So different treatments are required for these two kinds of uh, uh, problems. So the, the hypothesis is the brain mechanism underlying emotional states of consciousness are not different from those underlying any other kind of state of consciousness. What's different about emotional versus non-emotional experiences and different kinds of emotional experiences are the inputs processed by this cortical cognitive network. So oops, that's, uh, ignore the orange circle there. So let, here we have visual cortex, memory systems, and so forth uh, being re-represented in, uh, in, in these cortical networks. Now, Ned would say that it's all in visual cortex, but in, a, in our paper, Richard Brown and I say that for emotional experience, the re-representation in these cortical networks uh, it, through a high order representation is what gives rise to the conscious experience of fear. This is not a proven thing, this is our hypothesis. So um, all of this below the, um, uh, the cortex then would be thought of as lower order states, lower order representations that are re-represented. So in a non-emotional experience, again, forget the survival circuit part there, the, um, uh, this is what would say a perceptual experience, but in an emotional experience, we have a, a lot more going on, and that's what makes an emotional experience different from a non-emotional one. So in making emotions is, is kind of like uh, making a soup, where you have a bunch of things you can put in the soup, and um, none of these are soup ingredients per se. They're things that exist in nature, but when combined in this way, gives you the flavor of the soup. And so I think that uh, you know, it's kind of like this with emotions as well. A lot of things go into making the emotion that are not emotional uh, by any um, uh, predetermined uh, sense. So let's, um, here we can kind of look at what I'm talking about here. So it's going around the clock here are some things that would go into a kind of perceptual uh, conscious experience. We have sensory processing, semantic memory, Episodic memory, self schema, it gets more complicated. You might not need all, need all of these for every kind of perceptual representation, but as it gets more complicated, you add more stuff. But then as you swing past 12 o'clock and go into the emotion part of the uh, equation, you have uh, things like emotion schema. These are bodies of knowledge that uh, a child begins to build up, uh, starting with diffuse states of aversion and so forth. That, eventually become uh, fear, which can be separated then eventually into panic and horror and terror and so forth, and anxiety and trepidation. Um, you have survival circuit activity, um, for example, the amygdala circuitry. You have brain arousal uh, and body feedback. All of these things are popular in emotion theories. Uh, and through working memory, we can appraise, monitor, and attend all these things, and that allows us to have metacognitions and introspections and give verbal reports. Again, this is all our, our hypothesis. Um, so why is this kind of theory necessary? Well, one, you know, it's dominated, we're dominated by the amygdala view of fear. This is a predatory, immense, uh, predatory defense uh, fear circuit idea. But fear doesn't have an exclusive contract with an amygdala predatory defense circuit. We can fear harm from, the, from starvation, dehydration, hypothermia, reproductive isolation, each of which depends on other survival circuits. So what we feel depends on what kind of signals are being processed by working memory, including the signals from survival circuits, but other signals as well. So rather than having a, a subcortic, different subcortical circuits for different emotions, uh, basic emotions theory, I propose that the, the cortical 
uh, higher order representations account for emotional uh, and non-emotional experiences <coughs> in one system. So here we have, I just want to emphasize the importance of these different survival circuits. You're on a mountaintop and you have no food or water and you're uh, isolated uh, from shelter. Any, each of these or any of them can be the source of fear and anxiety, not just the, the activation of the amygdala and its defensive uh, survival activities. So none of this necessarily means that animals are fearless, uh, nor does it mean that we can know what they feel. Uh, so the phenomenon in question, for example, responding to danger, I'm going to break it down a little bit. So responding to danger, uh, no consciousness is required, and other animals definitely have it. Knowing what is dangerous and what's not dangerous, we can think of that as a kind of, to borrow Indel Talving's uh, distinction between noetic and autonoetic consciousness, we can think of that as a kind of noetic or semantic awareness. So knowing that, there, that something is dangerous, knowing that this is food, knowing that that's a mate and so forth, without necessarily knowing that I know I'm in danger, I know that I'm having sex or whatever. Uh, and while I'm not saying that other animals don't have that, as you go from noetic to autonoetic, it gets harder to know exactly uh, whether they have it or not. And you know, Diana's presented some beautiful evidence that shows that, they, that animals, other animals have these, the ability to recognize self in a, in a mirror. And I guess, you know, uh, I'm not sure how strong she pushes the conclusion that this is definitely conscious self-recognition or if it's a capacity that they have. But in a sense, the, you know, what's important is that we understand these basic mechanisms underlying this. And I know a number of people have said this in the conference, that whether it's conscious or not is in some sense less important than uh, whether we understand the connectivity between different kinds of processes in other animals and our brains. So the bottom line, I guess, is how one, where one lands on all of this is their tolerance for ambiguity. Uh, scientists are people and are inherently anthropomorphic uh, in many, many aspects of our lives. I go home, I pet my cat Petey, I treat him as if he's afraid and loving and has all of the emotions I have. Uh, but when you do experiments, you have to adopt a different set of criteria for asking and answering your questions. Um, you know, we, we start, we, uh, we, we first ask what, we, what we're going to measure, um, then we ask what does it mean? And since we can only creep up, to use Jeffrey Gray's term or uh, Marion's term, flirt with consciousness in animals, we have to decide you know, how much scientific ambiguity we can live with uh, when deciding what it means. Um, and so again, I'm not claiming that animals have none of these experiences, but personally I don't know, and so I remain on the kind of, I wouldn't say skeptical side, more the agnostic side. So, Here's a, a few conclusions. Human fear is a, a kind of social construct that's acquired incrementally in childhood uh, in a particular culture. The fear is different in every culture. It starts out as a diffuse kind of arousal and, and, a, and aversion and gradually comes to be refined. Unease, concern, apprehension, worry, fear, tannic, panic, terror. We have 37 words in English uh, to, to describe different aspects of fear and anxiety. Uh, assuming that fear is an innate experience that bubbles out of uh, an ancient subcortical circuit has had negative consequences. Uh, it's led researchers down conceptual rabbit holes, but also impaired our ability to understand how to help people with uncontrollable fear and anxiety. The words we use matter, I think, is the most important message I want to end with. Thank you. Panelists will come up to the stage. That would be a good thing. If I could figure out how to get this thing off, that would also be a good thing. Okay. Sorry? Oh, yeah, sure. So we, we have uh, a good amount of time now to have open, open discussion, and we've been given three really interesting and interestingly different papers. Uh, so, there's a, so, so there's a lot that's on the table. And I don't, you know, I'm not going to purport to have a single sort of brilliant question to try to get you to tie them all together. Um, but Joe did 
bring his conclusions back to bear on a certain view of animal consciousness, or to, 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 you know, to at least state a hypothesis about animal consciousness. And I wonder if before we just go into open discussion, whether Diana or Brian, who both sort of in a way almost deciduously avoided, <laughs> avoided talk of consciousness, might want to at least speculate or state an opinion or a hypothesis or put something on the, on, on the table here as a way of starting the conversation and coming into contact with Joe's remarks. Ladies first. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, so I, we're talking about fear now in dolphins, which uh, I have some experience with. I hope I don't cause it to them too often. Um, but you know, I think these things are really hard to define. And um, I think that when, again, I'm stuck with behavior because I can't get into that head. I don't know what, I'm, I'm not a neuroscientist. And I, I look at behavior and I can see similar correlates in what we see in ourselves and other animals that I would call, using the word loosely, a fear response. Um, I can look at it change over time. You can work with animals and you can see that they may be fearful of certain stimuli and then you can try to mediate that, those responses, much like you do with a child. So for example, um, when my daughter was going to the pediatrician, I'm talking about things I know and I'm, I'm just being very subjective about this, but when my daughter would go to the pediatrician, I could try to relax her about getting a needle. I mean, we use words with our kids, needle. But who's not going to be afraid if they say you're going to get a needle? I mean, that just evokes all sorts of fear from the, you know, the semantics, the semantic aspects of it. So I told her, well, you're going to get a button. You know, and you can maybe say I was lying to my child, but I, I thought by using the word button somehow it wouldn't sound so bad, and it's going to give you some medication that's going to make you feel better. And she actually would, you know, seem to be, you know, relaxed. With animals, when we come to a pool with a veterinarian and they've got <coughs> a negative experience from being, you know, feeling some pain from getting an inoculation, you can actually work with animals, get them to relax um, by slowly getting them acclimated things, and you can reduce that kind of fearful response. Um, but you, again, I, we can see all sorts of behavior that I would call fear when people that they know that they've made associations with that have to do with being injured come, you know, they come to the side of the pool, you see avoidance behavior. So. You know, I don't quite know. I, I'm stuck with behavioral aspects. So, so, so what I took away from, <clears throat> sorry, my voice is being funny. Uh, what I took away from what Joe was saying is that there, there's multiple inputs and that there's some sort of appraisal that creates fear. I'm, I don't want to use the wrong words. Um, but, but uh, you know, at least what I took away is the amygdala, which has been attributed to be the fear center, uh, it plays a role. It's uh, ancient evolutionarily, and it helps, uh, uh, you know, sense or send some kind of, valence about something that might be threatening and that's one piece of information that then is processed uh, and then I think what your point was is that because the part where fear gets processed is very hard then to move forward because different animals may be pulling in different types of information and it's hard to then model what that is whereas there's been so much great progress in understanding and measuring what the amygdala does uh, as a threat circuit I think no that's that's fair okay I liked it. <laughs> okay, well, let's see if Ned liked it. <laughs> so this is a, a, a question for Joe. Um, uh, I should say that... The disadvantage of going last, Eli. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, Joe has defended this, this view in our uh, Philosophy of Mind discussion group, but I wonder if the audience, and in particular you two, really get just how counterintuitive this view is. Okay, so no. I'm gonna, <laughs> <laughs> so me. here I'm gonna state it, Joe can say whether, I've, whether he really subscribes to this, but as I understand the view, it's a version of this higher order thought theory of consciousness. And the idea is in order to have a conscious experience of fear, worry, anxiety, you have to have the concepts of fear, worry or anxiety, you have to have distinct <laughs> concepts. So basically, you know, putting in this kind of slogan form, what it is to have a conscious experience of fear is to be kind of saying to yourself, I, have a, I, have, I am fearful. What it is to have a conscious experience of worry is to have, say to yourself or really have the thought, I am, I am, I'm worried. People you know, often do, can have those experiences without having those concepts. Take, say, for example, 
envy versus jealousy. A lot of people, maybe most people, don't really fully make the distinction. But you can have a conscious experience of envy, a, a distinct conscious experience of jealousy. There are different things. Do you do people? So that's what's so profoundly counterintuitive about it but, is that you but, not but, only have you have to have in order to have that conscious experience, you have to have the concepts. You know, we have, you know, children can have can be consciously angry. Um, uh, can consciously can fearful, can consciously anxious. Clarifying question for yeah. the naive up here. Does it, does it help if you replace concept with category? Because if you... Well, if, you have if, to represent if, it in your thought. If, but I can represent a predator. I can represent a friend, a mother, a This is representing your own state I, I in mean, your thought. All, animals are great at representing categories. So yeah, this is a category of your own thought. Your own thought okay. your, your, this is a category of your... Sorry, it's in a category of your own emotion. Got it. Okay. You have to have categories in your mind for all these different emotions in order to have conscious emotions. Okay. Can I respond? Okay. <laughs> so um, I don't think that's exactly what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that if you have those categories, then you pretty quickly pattern complete to them um, in working memory. And a child is not going to have the categories, obviously. It's going to have the, as I described, as the child begins to first experience danger, uh, it will begin to construct these um, sort of diffuse states of aversion that will differentiate with more and more experiences and more and more social feedback about what those experiences are. The parents say, oh, that you were afraid or you were anxious or you, know, you were nervous or whatever, and you begin to understand what those things mean. And so once you have those words, you're, as soon as your experiences begin to happen, you begin to categorize your experiences with those words. So I think that's different from what you portrayed. But I, I think also, I don't want to get too hung up on the higher order theory here, because that's just our hypothesis. But most of what I'm talking about is the way that the amygdala has been, I think, misinterpreted mm. as being the core of a fear system. Uh, and much of our understanding of what behavior means has been based on the assumption that the amygdala is uh, feeling fear, and that's what's driving the behavior. Mm -hmm. That's the key. I just thing. want to say, I, I take that point, and and uh, look, I agree with the p point you're making about about uh, the the mistake right. that um, people made. But uh, I'm really talking about the the higher order yeah, no. hypothesis. Right. Um, I'm assuming that from what I know from how you think about these, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's that you're not saying that it needs to be labeled, that people can <coughs> still have the experience of the emotion, of, an, of a feeling, have a feeling of, say, fear, and only be able to label it later, but it's not in the labeling that gives them the feeling, right? No, but, the, I mean, you start to have a, a feeling, but as soon as, you know, you, we, do, we do this, we label it as it's happening. I guess, so this is this is my question. I can I buy into the subcortical amygdala processes occurring, and then only the feeling being instantiated in the cortex of fear or the concept of fear. But does that mean then that you need a cortex to experience a feeling? Well, in other it, animals, let's say. So let's say you have. Uh, your, I mean, the, that's the question about do you need your cortex for any kind of conscious experience? I mean, my, my view has always been once we understand consciousness, we get emotion for free. That's a great line to end that exchange on. Uh, I, I think, well, let's go here next. Uh, uh, it's a question to uh, Ledoux. Uh, do you, uh, n and also I have a question for her. Uh, so, is it is it that you you're, you're talking about aversion? Now aversion, I don't know what whether you uh, aversion is a word that you use which implies some kind of feeling, some kind of negative, some kind of negative thing that the animal as a whole feels in a non-distinct way, maybe, but nevertheless does feel. If it does, then it is some kind of conscious experience phenomenon. Uh, phenomenal conscious experience of some kind. It can be qualified afterwards by all kinds of higher order processes. So are you sort of suggesting something like Barrett has suggested, that you have like two axes, one of arousal, high arousal, low arousal, and then you have another axis of, say, of uh, aversion versus pleasure. And in, and in the space that is created by these two, 
and in addition, higher order processes, then you have the definition of whatever it is, a particular emotion that, uh, that we, uh, so the fear, yes, a dog will feel fear, but it will be a different kind of fear right. from the human fear. Is this, is, is this what you're saying? No. No. Um, I'm saying that about humans to some extent, but I don't know what an animal feels, so I'm not gonna say, I mean, I just. But does it feel aversion? I don't know. I mean, how would you know? I mean, you can judge their behavior, but you know, as a as a, a human, I would say yes. But as a scientist, I say I don't know. Okay. So in terms of Lisa Barrett's theory, uh, we overlap quite a bit. Um, I've been a, what she calls a constructionist since I did split brain research in nineteen in 1970s, uh, and we started thinking <coughs> of conscious experience as the interpretation of behaviors that the right hemisphere was generating. Mm -hmm. So that's where I come from in, in all of this and my interest in consciousness. I've always been interested in consciousness, but after my PhD, I left consciousness behind. Mike Zanaga took the interpretation part and ran with that, and I ran with the subcortical idea of, of emotions being these implicit uh, non-conscious states that we interpret when they generate behaviors. Uh, but I, I came to feel that talking about those in terms of fear and emotion and other things, even though I was talking about implicit fear, uh, I was always accused of or attributed to be saying, uh, seemed to be saying uh, conscious fear in the amygdala. So that's... And the question circles for honored for saying. <laughs> and the question for her, uh, so are you suggesting in what you said that uh, a pros uh, about dogs and bonobos that uh, in humans what we have to think about is a kind of process of self-domestication? Uh, the title of our hypothesis is the human self-domestication hypothesis, and it's based on Dmitry Belayev's Fox work. I mean, that's where the genesis of it comes from, yes. Just trying to clarify uh, your your position, uh, following up on Ned Block a little bit. Uh, I I don't quite get what the problem is with attributing the the felt fear, genuine felt fear, uh, to uh, you mentioned cat and dog and so on. Uh, they have the cortex. Uh, the 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 fact that that fear can be experienced without amygdala, I have no problem buying. But why should why should one have a question I'm mark? Not, I'm not saying they don't. I, as, a, I, as a scientist, I can't measure it well, in, in the way that, that I'm comfortable with. Okay, but then by, by, by the homology arguments, with the very strong homologies between, uh, across all mammalian brains, the only difference that remains that could cause your question mark is language. Namely, is it, is it like uh, Ned suggests, that you really think that you need the thought, the, 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 the verbally formulated conceptual thought, I am afraid, to experience fear? Well, as Daniel Dennett once said, uh, language is the, uh, the tracks or roads that we, uh, our mind travels on. I think that that's an important point. I mean, I don't know what Dan thinks I, about what I've been saying. I'll, I'll, you go first then. Just Joe, on follow up, how can an animal be conditioned then if they don't have the qualitative experience? How would you condition an animal to, to avoid well, fearful situations? Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, a, a tone goes into the brain, uh, piece of food goes into the mouth and they interact at synaptics interact you know the cells on the, they interact on the same cells and the cells change it's not you know but it's if there's no valenced level. experience it's why would a rat prefer thing. food to uh, a shock well now let's take let's take an example of what the brain is doing it, the brain knows nothing about <coughs> reality it's just getting electrical and chemical signals uh, as it's sending information through it. When those signal, when the neurotransmitter is released on a neuron uh, that, and it only weakly excites that neuron, not much is going to happen. But if it gets a stronger input from another neuron, then the weaker one is going to be potentiated and that cell, that, that input is going to then activate the cell in a way that it didn't before. And that's really all you need to get a stimulus through the brain. Okay, so I, I think there's two more questions that are clearly on this thread, and then without trying to suppress this thread, I would like to encourage anyone who may have questions for any of the other talks to also enter the conversation. But Dan? Um, I think, Joe, that while language does play a very important role, um, there are things 
that are like concepts, like the concepts that philosophers of language talk about, that aren't language dependent. Uh, Ruth Millikan has a wonderful new book out called Beyond Concepts, and uh, she calls them unicepts mm -hmm. and unitrackers. And the thing about them that, that matters here is that they can play the, just the role that you said uh, of a sort of uh, completion phenomena where uh, once you have a, a, a small repertory of these, uh, things that happen get sorted, they get categorized uh, by these automatic uh, sort of category magnets. And that uh, there's plenty of room then for maintaining that uh, w yeah. what you need to get as it were real fear is not so much, I mean, what, what beyond the amygdala uh, defensive circuit acti action do you need? You need this uh, crystallization or, or, or uh, uh, something like that to happen at the, at the unicept level and animals have unicepts, and they don't need language for that. I, could I just add one thing? I mean, so one of the um, one of the things I, a books I read years ago was by Jerome Bruner, Child Talk. It's a wonderful book if you haven't read it. And he addresses this issue of how language develops. I'm gonna just mention this for a minute because he talks about the pre-linguistic child, the pre-verbal child, organizing their world in terms of motor behaviors. And you know, so, so um, Mikey can take the bottle and hit Joe on the head. So Mikey takes, I'm not, this is not aggressive to you, right? But Mikey takes bottle, hits Joe on the head, Mikey takes bottle and drinks from it, Mikey takes bottle and gives it to Brian because I'm pro-social. And, and that we organize our world non-verbally. And that goes in, it, and it connects, it integrates our motor behaviors, our thinking. You know, and it gets back to can we think without words, and that brings it back into our world of animal consciousness or animal thinking, if you just want to go into it. And I think that when we look at a, a pre-linguistic child, and again, I'm going to use an example of my daughter, you know, if she falls and she doesn't have words for that, she may experience fear. We'll just use that word as a marker. And sometimes you see kids and they fall and it might physically hurt them, they may feel pain, but they don't start crying until everybody starts reacting. Oh my goodness, are you okay? And then you get all these social, all the other social cues and that go into a higher, you know, that we start associating with that act of falling. So it's really complex, I think. And well, again, I'm not saying that animals yeah. are not having these experiences. I'm saying as a scientist, <coughs> I don't know how to measure those things, period, that's it. I'm, I'm tempted to ask a question at that point, but I won't. Yes? Sorry, this, this is really by way of a very, very short story and not a question, but the story may be Surgeon General's warning. The story may either be really, really illustrative of something important, or it may be absolutely nothing, but interesting nevertheless. When I was completing my field work for my dissertation in, in South Africa, I took a weekend off to go on a walkabout safari about 30 kilometers outside of Johannesburg. And I was walking around, m minding my own business, enjoying watching Eland and Kudu walking around so seemingly oblivious of me. And I, I sort of was by myself. My friend had disappeared. There were only two of us. We didn't have a car anywhere nearby. And I walked, and all of a sudden, literally, like a movie, a description from a movie, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I started sweating, and I had a palpable sense of panic. And I couldn't put my finger on it. And then I looked down. <laughs> And what I looked down and saw immediately gave a name to, to what, uh, seemingly to what I was, was, uh, was responding to. I had accidentally walked into a troop of about 25 baboons. And the nearest baboon was about a foot and a half away from me. And had I taken a misstep, I would have probably hit him in the head and my arm would have been torn out of its socket and he would have beaten me to death with it or something horrible. <laughs> But I had this palpable sense, and it was a very clear sensation. It had all this physiology accorded to it, you know. But I really didn't, I didn't have a name. I, I just knew it was panic, and I felt panic. And later, it, it sort of got transcribed later as fear. <laughs> What's that? You had a name, it was panic. It was panic, yeah, it was panic. So, but in any case, it was an interesting sort of a, a categorical, there was no category there initially, or nothing that you I could. Said panic. You, you well, said yeah, 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 yeah. I probably didn't really even use that term when I when I immediately, but yeah, good point. Okay, fair enough. Was that a question? 
<laughs> okay, good, because I panicked for a moment when I could. Uh, Anya. Here we go, Anya. Uh, can you pass the uh, So that's a mirror experiment question, uh, and it's just to get uh, the view of the expert on my own mirror experiment. So I was always uh, sad that cats do so badly in these experiments. They are often presented as, you know, the dummies who then kind of bat at the mirror or something like that. Um, but what I noticed is that uh, when uh, I'm in the mirror, my cat notices me in the mirror. And I thought I could maybe use that to do a modified mirror experiment with my cat. So if I have my cat and myself uh, in front of a mirror, and then I put a treat uh, on my shoulder, the cat sees the treat in the mirror on the shoulder of that person in the mirror. It doesn't go to the mirror to the treat. It directly turns to me to get the treat. Doesn't that mean that the cat must know that he is, in fact, the guy who is on my arm and that, you know, that's me and that's him? So that's really interesting because it gets into s some, some aspect of spatial recognition, spatial understanding. And there's a term for that. It's called mirror-guided behavior. So there are species like pigs, for example, who have shown mirror-guided behavior who don't go on to show evidence, behavioral evidence, of mirror self-recognition. I say behavioral evidence because it's conceivable that your cat does understand something about itself in relationship to you in the mirror. The, and we can't, it's been very hard to measure that. So we're stuck with these terms of either saying it's mere guided behavior, so a pig will have food hidden in its, in its environment. Or elephants, before we did the study, Danny Povinelli did a study with elephants at the National Zoo, the same elephants, and um, showed, at Smithsonian Central Zoo, show, they had a mirror and he hid food. They never showed any behavior oriented to themselves in the mirror. So he concluded they didn't show mirror self-recognition. But when he hid food that they could only perceive visually with, when the mirror was there, they found it. And he said he controlled for olfactory cues by giving them mints to suck on and things like that. Um, then they used it. Now, are those, were those animals showing false negatives because they did know something about that spatial relationship? It's possible because we later showed that using the right mirror at the right distance where perhaps they could see themselves better, they did show it. So it's conceivable cats know more than we think or don't. I think we just need more testing. But some animals you know, just show these kinds of differential behaviors. I just want to say something. I think one of the things that's exciting to me about the mirror is um, it allows us to ask questions about why don't certain animals show it? And, you know, for, for, for example, so the great apes have all shown it to a greater or lesser degree. Orang orangutans show it, um, it not as strongly as it's been shown in chimpanzees and gorillas, less so as well. But um, why don't monkeys show it spontaneously? And there have been studies where they've trained, they've trained monkeys, and they eventually attend to a mirror and can show Evident, behavioral evidence of self-recognition, but after explicit training or if um, an implant has been put on a monkey's head, monkeys that otherwise have never shown it and, and their, their cage mates don't show it, will start pulling at this implant and in front of the mirror, there seems to be either sufficient tactile or visual information that they'll start showing it. I mean, those are those things that make you think, well, wh why, why do some animals show it spontaneously and others either need really explicit training or don't show it at all? And I think that's a whole area of interest. Maybe that will help us search for some neuro neurological correlates to what, what's different in these brains. So, Dale, this young lady has had her hand up for about 10 minutes. Oh, exactly. I feel far really, really bad. I'm having a strong, empathetic response. Oh. Yeah, right. Whoever that person is, you're next. And then we'll go to Dave. Thank you. I now know what it feels like to be a rock star. Yeah, right. <laughs> Hi. Um, so as I think Joseph was kind of showing, we can't scientifically prove phenomenal experience in animals. Um, and Diana, you really showed well, the best thing that we really try to do is show the behavioral aspects of animals that really replicate our own phenomenal experiences. Um, but what I see is the problem with the behavioral approach is if we take this, and I want to see your guys' perspective, is if we're only analyzing behavior and if it replicates our own, what does that say to you guys about, say, artificial intelligence, robots that can perfectly replicate our, 
our behavior. And to you, I mean, that would show, <coughs> does that show self-consciousness and does that show phenomenal consciousness if that is only the, if behavior is the only approach we take? I agree. I think, I think that's to you guys. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I, I really appreciate what you're saying. I, I was I reviewed a paper several years ago about with where they trained a robot to show uh, self-directed behavior in front of a mirror. It was a really interesting paper. I don't have the answer to that, but there's some. I and I don't know how far we can take uh, working with computers or robots till we can get to say, yes, they are self-aware. I really don't have that answer. I think it's a fascinating question. Will they ever truly show self-awareness in the way we think we show it as humans? And we don't know what it's like to be a dolphin and be self-aware. We, we're stuck with this behavior. I agree. But the behavior that they show is not just that they do behaviors at a mirror. I want to be really clear about this. They actually seek out a mirror as a tool. And I think it's not addressed enough. So once that those stages emerge and you see self-directed behavior, which is the real indicator, and then you see you know, they pass the mark test, it's not like they go away. You put a mirror in that pool and you can put it in different places. It's not like they run to it, like it's a stimulus. We don't run to mirrors. But you see at different times, they'll go, they'll orient their bodies. They use it as a tool. We've actually watched dolphins, and Danny Povinelli saw this with the chimpanzees. Once you see really well-established self-directed behaviors, every so often they'll do something that's incredibly social looking. So we would have dolphins in a pool showing months, uh, one dolphin, Foster, that I showed you, months of self-directed behavior, not one instance of anything social. And then he gets into an aggressive skirmish with his, one of his buddies in the pool. He leaves that, he comes over to the mirror, does a couple of aggressive behaviors to the mirror, and then goes back to the mirror and does, and it goes back into the social interaction. And I called Danny, I said, this is weird, did you ever see it? And he said, yeah, he thinks they're looking at themselves doing aggression and then going back. And it's, it's very interesting when you see, so it's, there are layers of this. It's not just one behavior, a shift in behavior, it's how they use it, how we use mirrors. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's pathological if you're in front of a mirror all the time. We don't expect animals to do that. They have lives. So, I, just so I, I, would just quickly, I would just quickly add one thing is I like to think of myself as a cognitive psychologist. I, I measure behavior, but I'm trying to infer internal mental states So from the behavioral responses. So, so I, of course, I study behavior, but I'm trying to understand what's going on inside the minds of these animals. Dave. Okay, this was um, this is more of a follow up on Anya's question about the uh, the cats that uh, mm -hmm. don't recognize themselves in the mirror, but are still good with the mirrors. I'm thinking this is actually pretty bad for your cats because uh, <laughs> you know one one hypothesis about uh, what's going on in a lot of these cases of the mirror test where people don't recognize themselves in mirrors is well, they're still you know where, where creatures don't recognize themselves in mirrors as well, they're self conscious, they're just bad with mirrors. Uh, on the other hand, if it turns out they're actually pretty good with mirrors in cases other than oneself, and that knocks out that hypothesis, and you're left with, maybe the, I'm sorry, but maybe the problem is just with their self-recognition or their self-consciousness. Well, you know, it makes you wonder why cats, do I mean, for, for dogs and cats, for example, cats, if you stare at a cat, that can be seen as an aggressive act, and those have been ideas why cats don't show it, or dogs. It's aggressive if a dog stares at another dog. But you can bring a dog's selective attention towards a mirror, and it's just like, it's just not there. It just doesn't happen. And, but again, I just want to state, it doesn't mean the dog isn't self-aware. I think anim mirrors are just one test that allow us to see this external behavior and change in the way they're processing information over time, and that's why I think it's useful. And we can compare when children get to a certain stage where they show the mirror in relationship to when they're developing empathy and other levels of social awareness. It's just, a helpful tool, I think. Just quickly to add to that point is to say that I, I would not get wedded to any one measure. Um, you know, I think that part of the advances in studying animal psychology has been taking an ecological approach and thinking about where would a cat show self-awareness. Uh, you know, experiments are artificial by definition, but if you can embed them in some context where the animal is either motivated or more likely to show its most flexible behavior. So, for instance, there's a beautiful study uh, on uh, dog self-awareness looking at how they inspect urine. 
Um, and whether or not you believe the result, the point is that using a different methodology and thinking about when is it that a dog would be most likely to need to understand its own self from someone else. You might see something that hasn't been seen yet. So we'll get to you again, Dan. But we got a couple other people first. I think. Uh, this question is for Joe. Uh, there's two sentences that you said, and those sentences also appeared in a different form in another speaker on the first day, Stuart Derbyshire. And I wanted you to explain these two sentences to me. As a person, I do. As a scientist, I don't. All that means is that when I'm evaluating data, the criteria of what I interpret is different from what I do in my daily life. Can, can I just quickly add what I've heard those folks saying is that give me a falsifiable hypothesis. And uh, I think that's partly what you're saying yeah. is it, when you say you don't know what to measure, you're saying I don't know how to falsify the hypothesis. Who should we believe? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that there's so much we can study without getting too hung up on the question about what the experience is. I mean, there's I'm not saying they don't have the experience, but we get into these kind of, you know, circular debates about what it is. And there's so much, you know, from your kind of work and your kind of work and, uh, uh, you know, all the stuff that goes on in the cognitive uh, ethology and cognitive science of, of animal behavior that's so important for understanding our evolutionary history. Uh, it, let's, say, let's say that animals are completely unconscious. They do everything unconsciously. But studying working memory in the primate is going to tell us a tremendous amount about what working memory does in the human brain and therefore what the evolutionary trajectory of human working memory is. And if that has something to do with consciousness, then it's helping us understand consciousness. I mean, could we, I, I don't, I, there are questions, I don't want to keep talking here, but I just have a couple. No, you should keep talking, keep talking. it's your session. Oh, thank you, okay, <laughs> so this, this is a great feeling. Okay, so I think what's interesting to me is when you think about animals and survival and the fact that they're facing challenges, you know, remembering, having good storage capacity, memory, being able to use what you've experienced before, that's adaptive for many animals. For some animals, it may be hard, it may be that, storage and hardwiring a few things is important, but for other animals, that kind of flexibility we've been talking about is adaptive. And again, I, we're all grappling with these words, consciousness, intelligence, and it, they're all so slippery, you know, all, the, all of these terms. I, I keep on going back to a definition that I heard by Ross Ashby, who is a cybernetician. He wrote a book called Introduction to Cybernetics, and he talks about if we're trying to think about intelligence in humans, in animals, uh, non-human animals or machines, he, he offered this idea that it's the power of appropriate selection. And I've always liked that because, Brian, uh, you were talking about this too, if you say, well, which animal's more intelligent? It depends on that animal's sensory systems, their unwelt, what the challenges are, how do they act in that world? And it, what's nice about it, it lets us look at behavior of that organism in, in terms of an evolutionary point of view and in its environment, and then making these behavioral comparisons is a really rich endeavor. Not necessarily saying, are they aware of everything that they're doing? Because we don't know when we're aware of everything we're doing, but what are the varieties? I'm going back to what I suggested. What are the varieties of experience? And we can plug in words like behavioral or consciousness or intelligence. I just think it's really helpful, for me at least as a scientist, to look at comparative behavior the other thing I just want to mention is this idea is, would we recognize another form of consciousness if, if it was there? And again, that gets into my first slide with arrival. You know, we're, we're, you know, for us, we can use these mirror studies. And that's sort of like low-hanging fruit in a way because we see it can work with children, it can work with chimps, to try it with dolphins and elephants. They were sort of the natural candidates. But what about other forms of intelligence? This is more of a philosophical point of view. Other animals may show things we can't imagine. In Arrival, they had these uh, heptapods that thought about time in different ways. Earlier, we heard about the fact that insects may perceive time in different ways. So it sort of stretches our imagination to think about what can we know and how do we ask those questions. So I just wanted to mention that. Peter. So this is a question for Brian. I'm here. Hi. Um, so I, I'm 
I'm trying to understand how, how you think the process of self-domestication works. And, and very crudely, here, here are two alternative ways of thinking about how it might work, right? So you select for friendliness, mm -hmm. and that at the same time selects to build a new cognitive module that's going to enable you to handle all these aspects of um, what social signals mean and so forth, right? That's one. The other would be you select for friendliness, and that then brings out latent abilities because now you're just paying a lot more attention to what other agents in your group are doing. So you think number two? I like number two. Yeah, that's I, what I, we propose. I, I thought you might, and that yeah. seems very plausible. So what happens, I think, is that w when you um, there's revealed variants. Uh, if you're a, a Blaya fox and you've been selected to be friendly, uh, you know there's variability that exists in a population of wild foxes. Uh, but they get above a threshold for interacting with one another. You select for friendliness. Now what you were afraid of or you were running away from and trying to bite, you now are approaching and want to interact with. And uh, so you just apply your old cognition to a new partner. There's revealed variants. Now you can have direct selection on that trait. Colin next. So um, it's really a question for Joseph Ledoux. Um, so I'm trying to think about this problem of how we could come up with some sort of experiment with, that would satisfy you that there's a scientific road in here. And I yes. want to distinguish sort of any form of skepticism which just sort of starts at the outset saying nothing could possibly convince. So let me run this by you. So suppose I've got a couple of drugs, one of which generates, and we can test this on humans first, maybe it's anxiogenic, so it makes you feel anxious, and we're pretty secure on that, and another one, I don't know, maybe makes you feel thirsty, right? Drug A and drug B. And I, if I run this as a human experiment, I can say to my participants, okay, when you get this feeling, I'm going to inject something, I'm not going to tell you which, right? And when you get this feeling, right, press button A, and when you get this other feeling, press button B, all right? Um, now, can I not take that experiment and run it very similarly with animals, where the response is not something that is sort of in, innately tied to the you know, responses that you posited as sort of at the small fear, small letter fear level, but, but something completely sort of artificially arbitrary with respect to the animal's own internal state. Would that be enough to convince you that you can actually show that the animals are aware of their own internal state? Well, you'd have to show that they're solving the problem the same way. Same way as? As the human. Well, so we can look at it in circuit terms, perhaps, and show that the, the same sorts of circuitry is activated. I mean, take your story about the amygdala um, and fear, uh, you know, being the small fear part of the circuit, but maybe not necessarily big fear because that's mm -hmm. cortical. Still, we, I think we know, and you know a lot more about this than I do, that what happens in, in scary situations is the amygdala actually... Um, I think dumps acetylcholine into the hippocampus and sort of modulates its responsiveness in all sorts of interesting ways that affect learning, affect perception of the situation because the amygdala is also talking to cortical circuits and sort of helping you categorize what it is that you're presented with. Um, oh, it's baboons, right? But, you know, so, so um, um, uh, if we show that, that all of those structures are... are present and being used to solve this problem of how do I respond in this situation, where that response is not just a, a freeze or, or flee, but something more cognitively mediated would that do? You know, my problem is this, that in people, you have two responses that you can match up against each other. One is a, a verbal report, and the other is a nonverbal response. When you're conscious of something, you can respond either verbally or nonverbally. But when you aren't conscious of it, in a sense, you can only respond nonverbally. And you just don't have that in animals. But I've just given you two different kinds of nonverbal response, one being a kind of automate, automated, evolved response, the other being something that's conventionalized within an experimental situation. So, you, so the animal does have two ways to respond in this way. So, I mean... I guess the first step would be to demonstrate that in the human, the, the awareness is required as opposed to some automatic process, or more automatic. And then you'd have to demonstrate that in, in the animal, it wasn't some kind of uh, conditioned association or implicit process of some kind. Uh, yeah, I, I just don't know. I mean, I, I'm, 
I hate to be so hard-nosed about it, but it's just my level of comfort uh, in how I interpret data. Dan. Um, first, to Colin, um, I don't know how you're going to train that animal. Uh, the human subjects you can train by giving them a little verbal protocol. Uh, I suggest if you think of doing the experiment pure, leave out the verbal protocol and see if you can condition the human beings and, and in, with, the arbitrary, with the arbitrary association. And I think you're going to find you get into all sorts of headaches when you try to do that. Don't agree. Well, all right. Uh, then. It's difficult, but I don't think it's impossible. Okay. Well, I'd love to see you try. But I actually have a, I have a, I have a question for, for Diana. Um, mirrors are strange and unnatural objects in many ways, uh, but there's plenty of uh, sort of feedback from the environment, which is, in fact, self-caused, and animals are pretty good, I think, many animals, at not being freaked out by it. They don't tend to be bothered by their own shadows or by the moving of their own shadows when they're moving or by the sounds of the, of the twigs that they break with their own paws and so forth. And uh, it seems to me that in some sense that's just as good a proof of, of self-recognition as, as the mirror test. After all, um, they don't know what they look like, mm -hmm. so they're using the same sort of uh, co-occurrence uh, dynamic co-occurrence in both cases. There's an experiment, I think, that Emil Menzel did years ago, and I don't know why it isn't discussed. Maybe I'm just m making it up or misremembering or something, where he had, a, I think it was a chimpanzee, who uh, there was a closed-circuit television, and he could watch the closed-circuit television and reach his arm through a hole in the wall and use the view on the closed-circuit television to guide his arm to food that was hiding within, within sight. Now that, I thought, was a brilliant experiment. Mm -hmm. I don't know why people don't talk about it and why they don't do variations on it. Yeah, I, don't, I, didn't, I hadn't heard about that one either. I mean, it really seems very goal-directed and understand Absolutely. And there's proprioceptive feedback involved and understanding contingencies of that. No, it's a brilliant experiment. I'll have to look that one up. Thank you for mentioning that. I'll have to look it up. I don't know that one. I hope I didn't make it it's up. It's probably because you can't get it on Google or something. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll do it anyway. Do it. Yeah, let's try <laughs> Okay, so now all of a sudden there's an explosion of hands. Uh, this always happens in the last five minutes, uh, of which the first exploder that I saw was that one. And then we'll take one over there. And please make your questions uh, very brief because I can't fully bite my tongue and we'll ask the last question. So. Okay, uh, thanks. I think this question is uh, for Ledoux and I, I hope I've understood uh, some of the research that you pointed to correctly. So what I, what I want to know is, is what you think the implications of such research is for what look like perfectly good folk psychological explanations. So it seems like I can predict what someone is going to do in a certain situation by citing their fear of spiders. And then when I expose them to a, a spider and they run out of the room, it seems like I can explain their behavior by saying, ah, just as I predicted, they feared the spider. So I'm wondering, does this kind of research either show that the explanation is not a good one at all, or does it show that the explanation is a good one, but not because the fear actually caused the behavior, but because it was correlated with a mechanism, some sort of threat processing mecha mechanism that did cause the behavior. So I'm just wondering what you think well, the implications I, I would are. I say it's the correlation, obviously, given the, you know, the points I made. But okay, so let's take, let's take one question from over there. <laughs> There's a couple. Who has their hand the highest over there? Uh, who can tackle the oh, grab? No, no, whatever, whoever. <laughs> um, this might seem slightly uh, off topic, but th I wanted to know if there's any evidence um, outside primates for cumula cumulative culture. And, and then if there is, is there any evidence that social norms play a role in creating it? Yeah, so um, there's, there's growing evidence for cetaceans, particularly orcas, um, for 
cultural cultural learning again when we look at groups how a new behavior can be passed through that you know but through that society um, I'm going to also mention uh, some evidence that we have that we haven't published yet, but on even something, I'll go back with the bubble rings, for example. So there are cultures of bubble ring blowers, for example, in in captivity. These animals have enrichment, but yet they blow these rings, and we've seen it at SeaWorld, and we've seen it at the New York Aquarium, we've seen it at National Aquarium. So we've had cases where you'll see one animal comes from a bubble ring culture, like at SeaWorld, comes into a non-bubble produced ring culture at National Aquarium, and that one animal starts doing it, and it spreads through the group, and then you see variations on how they do it, much like I showed you. So I think with dolphins there, they have a strong proclivity, and we know less about the proclivities of orcas, but dolphins have proclivities, strong proclivity for both behavioral and vocal imitation. Um, so it, and I think you see these things being imitated, observed, and then imitated either immediately or delayed. You see lots of behaviors like this. And I think that for dolphins, we see culture evidence for culture in, um, in the field in terms of some foraging specializations and that we watch the offspring. We have a case where we've seen offspring now learning in Belize to do similar kinds of things. But our, our, our data is quite limited now. But I think cetaceans would be good candidates. So, so on the question of norms, uh, which has been a hot area for folks interested in, human psychology, development, evolution. Uh, if you're talking about a shared understanding uh, about appropriate behavior or uh, joint goals, uh, that would you could get a pretty uh, good debate going, uh, uh, just like we had on consciousness. And I would say, for me, I'd say there's no experimental evidence that animals are capable of anything that looks like that type of norm. There is evidence that if you introduce one novel action to a group, uh, and they'll learn the novel action that their group uh, is doing, and they'll they'll change from one they had previously been doing that is an equally good solution. Um, but is that a shared, you know, understanding of uh, how we should be beha behaving together as a group? Uh, I don't think that uh, we have no experimental evidence or uh, to suggest that. And then I just, uh, I actually think there is evidence for cumulative culture in animals, but just to be fair to the literature, there are plenty of people who would argue, even in the case of chimpanzees, that number one, most of the novel actions that are created, you can see in chimpanzees in captivity, uh, create, they can create those uh, innovations on their own through individual learning and very rapidly. Uh, and that mo many of the variations that have been uh, pointed to as being culturally transmitted actually are just uh, due to the affordances of the ecology that the different chimpanzees are living in. Um, for instance, the most famous example is uh, there's a population of chimpanzees in Central Africa that lit use uh, long sticks, and there's one in West that use short sticks that do ant dipping and pick ants up. Uh, the longer stick ants, it ends up, are incredibly aggressive. Uh, and the ants for the short stick uh, population are pretty like, oh, whatever, eat us. Um, and so, so the argument is, actually, it's not that they, they learn that through the, the use of longer or shorter sticks through individual learning. I just wanted to add one other thing, though. A question that gets coupled with that is, do you see evidence for teaching? Or is it, and I know at least in, in for most animals, Teaching doesn't seem to be part of the equation. There's some discussion about with chimps, are they actually putting tools or rocks right in front of another chimp and, and sort of make, demonstrating for them, and I think that's still questionable. But with dolphins, we've seen lots of learning, and there doesn't seem to be that kind of teaching. You, the animals seem to observe a, what the others are doing, and then they may pick it up at some later point. It's more observational learning. Okay, so we'll close with this. So. This is a question that really comes from a kind of observation about the conference as a whole, since we've really heard all the presentations. And it's an invitation, though, for the three of you to respond, and in a way kind of leans into the fi final panel. Um, we've heard almost no one who really has sort of made a point of denying consciousness in particular <coughs> taxa. I think one person did. The position has either been to sort of argue argue for its existence, argue for its possibility, uh, or to remain agnostic. Uh, 
And one, but one of the things that hasn't actually been addressed, and, and so particularly when we get to, into the zone of agnosticism, there's sort of assumptions being made about the standard of scientific proof and evidence. And nothing has really been much said about that. But, um, but, there, is, there, but there is an argument that, in fact, standards of scientific evidence are themselves domain relative. So, for example, if what we're worried about is whether some there, there's actually some new elementary particle, and nothing much turns on this in terms of how we might actually behave and act in the world, then arguably the standard of evidence can actually be very, very high and very, very rigorous, and we should exclude all possible hypotheses and so on. But, but we can also look at a case that's exactly the opposite of that. So one of the most notorious cases in the medical ethics literature is the Tuskegee syphilis e experiment, where essentially... Um, African-American men who suffered from syphilis were left to remain untreated what's to, to observe the course of the disease. Now, what's often not remembered about that is it was actually good liberals who were conducting that experiment. And they were conducting that experiment because there was, an all, there was a hypothesis out there that the course of syphilis was actually different in African-Americans than it was in whites. And that needed to be excluded as part of the general project of actually showing that there were universal human responses to this kind of disease. Now, when we get to issues about animals, as well as issues, say, for example, about climate change and ozone depletion and lots of other issues, where matters of public policy actually begin to sort of interface with the science, it raises questions about what really should count as the standards of evidence. So if we take the question about whether animals have conscious states, for example, I mean, we heard in the ethics session yesterday that there's probably more to how people think about ethics in animals than consciousness, but consciousness is terribly important, and it's really going to affect people's views and affect public policy, uh, to, you know, whether or not people think that animals are conscious or not. So it kind of raises the question that in the sort of muon case or something, if the standard of evidence might be 99.9% .9 probability, like, you know, an old, you know, ivory soap commercial, and if in a kind of climate change case you might think, well, gee, if we know with like 90% certainty, you know, that we're warming the world, that's going to be good enough in this case, uh, does this have anything to tell us about how we might think of the standard of evidence for attributing conscious states to animals? Well, my comments are, are really from the perspective of what I want to do in my, when I write a paper. I'm not making a value judgment uh, about what scientists should do. So, so I would just say, uh, what are the, comp I mean, I, what I heard Peter Singer say, I think, was that Talking about consciousness and having all animals be conscious will help motivate people to, you know, be better to the environment, uh, protect animals, uh, maybe be more likely to be vegan. Um, I, I, that's an interesting hypothesis. I think it's actually testable. I think it's empirical. And and my my alternative would be, I actually think that. I don't talk to people and, and the first thing that comes out of their mouth is, oh, wow, you, you know, you've shown that animals are conscious. They say, wow, they're so much like me. They're like me. They're human. They're so human-like. And so I actually think it, it, if you were to ask me uh, as a conservationist or somebody who works on animal welfare, uh, what would I emphasize about animals to motivate people to care more about them? Uh, it wouldn't be that they're conscious. It would be that they, in many ways, share traits that we have in common, and and we and and they're human-like. And I think that's an empirical question. I think it's testable, uh, and it could very well be that talking about consciousness is counterproductive, or it could be that humanizing animals is counterproductive. But I think that, for me, would be the approach I would take as an empiricist. Yeah, I I agree. I think that um, cognitive research is one of our strongest conservation tools. Personally, I think that. We found that, and we've actually done some studies of this when I was at the Wildlife Conservation Society, that people seem to relate to other species that do things like they do. 
and whether consciousness is one of those things, it probably is, but families, animals that care for their young, animals that show mere self-recognition. Those mere studies were very popular. I mean, I've written papers and like four people have read them. They were all my family members. And other papers, <laughs> and other papers, you know, are read because people get it. So I think a lot of these studies, whether we're doing them with elephants and showing elephants recognize themselves in mirrors and dolphins, that seems to link to something that people care about. And I think we, as scientists, we do basic research because we want to understand and we use the proper controls. But then I think a lot of us, and I'll just speak about this for a minute because it's really important to me as a scientist, I feel like I was raised to sort of not go into an advocacy situation. Be a scientist, don't talk about it, other people can use it. But I think now and now there are more people who feel that as scientists we should share that information into other arenas, other political arenas, and do that a different kind of translational science where we can take what we're finding about the minds or the brain structures of animals and share it and have it play a role in hopefully public global policy and things like that. Well, just to be clear, I wasn't talking about advocacy, but actually just about standards of evidence. Mm. But let's thank our speakers. <laughs>